I wanted to thank everybody for turn, tuning in to the Texas Homeless Network SOAR Fundamentals presentation, online presentation. This is part three, which will be covering outcomes and special populations. This is the third part of the Fundamentals Online Training um, or online um, presentation. You should have already covered part one, going over the basics of SOAR, part two, covering SSA forms and medical summary reports, and then, of course, this is part three. So tracking outcomes. So just so that you guys know, um, PRA, so Policy Research Associates, has provided for all SOAR um, case managers around the nation a online tracking tool um, so that they can track their applications as well as the community leads or the state leads can also um, review and track applications as well. So it's um, this is a very, very easy application or um, very easy um, web-based app um, for you to go to in order to track these online applications. The web address is, of course, SOARTRACK at PRAINC.com. You can also get to the portal via SOARWORKS. If you Google SOARWORKS, you can go to the portal there, and um, the, uh, the button, the tab, will be mid-page for you to access the um, online application tracking or OAT tool. This web-based program allows case managers to keep track of their outcomes. So this is, of course, a free tracking program. It is very easy to use. Um, it is accessible from any web browser, and as well as there's nothing to download. Um, they keep all the information on a secure server, and in, all the information is HIPAA compliant. So in actuality, there is no personal identifying information that is collected around your applicant and your application. So when you go to the, um, the OAT site, you'll see a screen very similar to this. Um, and it will let you choose if you're a caseworker, an agency lead, a local lead, or a state team lead. You can enter your information. Um, and you'll do that the first time. Um, and it'll log you in. Um, you'll have a registration piece logged in. And that way you can always go back. You can track or look at any cases that you've done in the past. Now, we know that um, outcomes are crucial to what we are trying to do here through OAT. And um, this is uh, very helpful for us in our the initial applications and in the appeals. So what we can do is we can actually attract um, we can track the approval rates, so how quickly we, um, or actually if the, the approval is a yes or a no, so in a, um, a, um, an approval or a denial. And then um, the second one is how quickly we get a decision from the time that we turn in the application. And then finally, there's an optional part around critical components. So the first two pieces being the approval rate and the time to decision, that is, it is crucial um, for us as a state of Texas to be able to pull up that information, look at our rates, and also look at time to decision. That's how we really um, can determine what areas are doing very well with this practice. And then the critical, com critical components um, follow, and that is um, that can be very helpful as well. Um, and then other optional outcomes around housing and employment, and then Medicaid and other um, public benefit reimbursements that your client might getting might be getting. Um, all that information is optional to enter in and can just help us track um, what, a, what benefits a client is receiving. As I mentioned before, this site is HIPAA compliant, so there's no um, uh, personally identifiable identifiable information. So what PRA does here is you will be instructed to take the first two letters um, of your client's first name, the last two digits of their birth year, the first two letters of their last name, and then the last four digits of their social security number. You will take this um, combinations of letters and numbers and you will use that to create a applicant ID. 
So this applicant ID will be specific to each client, and this is how you will look up your client's information. So this is um, how we do not break HIPAA, is that we do not add anything else in around your client, um, no, you know, no social security numbers um, in totality, no um, other information, just this applicant ID information and then the, um, the included information about time to response um, and days to decision. What this allows us to do as a state and as a community is that we can prove our SOAR outcomes and how effective SOAR um, is by pulling up um, reports. And so the reports are limited, I can tell you that much right now. However, um, what they do is they really pinpoint um, the approvals, the denials, the total decisions, and the approval rate, as you can um, see here as outlined by my mouse here. Um, what we are looking at and what we're trying to improve here is the, um, the approval rate. Um, so as you can see for Colorado for this time frame, they're right at 71% um, of initial applications and then 75% of reconsiderations. And then um, this allows us to track the, um, the days to decision on both of those two. Um, of course, the approvals and denials here at the top. And then um, down here under the other uh, pieces, um, we can look for um, if they have applied for SSI only, SSDI only, or both, and then demographics, um, as well as other benefits. So as I was mentioning, you know, those core components are here at the top. Um, and then we have those other... Uh, you know, kind of fundamental pieces we're tracking, like um, have they applied for SSI, SSI um, or SSDI or both of those, and then the demographics. So this is, can be a very useful and helpful tool to us to be able to determine how, what kind of response we are giving out in the community. Um, and, um, you know, how quickly we are getting SOAR out there to individuals so um, that we can kind of determine where we need to, um, to strengthen, um, strengthen kind of a, you know, is it around case management support? Is it around kind of retraining and how to do these applications correctly? Or is it around just getting out to the clients? Um, it really kind of helps us pinpoint what those strengths are and what the weaknesses are. Okay, so special populations. So uh, typically, what, what I wanted to cover here is that um, typically when I go out to communities, there are specific populations that um, people ask a lot of questions about, and so I wanted to address those just briefly. Um, of course, I will um, pull up some information at the end of this webinar that you can, um, and a web page you can go to to get more information. So the special populations um, that I would just like to briefly talk about today are, of course, veterans um, and then children and then um, justice-involved persons or people in the criminal justice system. So around veterans and SSA benefits, um, it's important to know um, that the definition of disability and application process is different for VA um, and SSA um, benefits. So um, we're gonna, they're going to be looking at these factors here. Um, that we're looking at the discharge status of the client if they're from if they are a veteran. Um, also, those denied for VA benefits may still be eligible for SSI, SSDI, so we might be able to reapply for them. Um, and then um, veterans can access SSA benefits while they are waiting for VA benefits. So, um, so what we're trying to look at here is the fact that. Discharge status is not always um, the determination and that we can always, um, for those that have been denied VA benefits, we can always reapply for SSI and SSDI, um, and especially if they're, if they're waiting for benefits. So veterans who receive a partial disability rating um, and limited VA benefits may also receive supplemental SSA benefits. And then health insurance associated with SSA benefits can be important for veterans without um, VA health care, uh, of course, um, to be able to get those, um, those uh, health insurance supplements to those veterans as quickly as possible. And then, of course, SSA has special provisions for expediting um, disability applications for wounded, wounded warriors um, 
that also um, apply to appeals. So it's always great when working around this population um, to ask questions around discharge status, um, just to get some information, not that this is going to necessarily hold up the process, um, but also um, that we can go ahead and we can apply for benefits even if that person has been denied by the VA. So um, I just want you guys to know that we do encourage um, VA staff to participate in SOAR trainings and to assist in SSI and SSDI applications. Um, and then um, we may disclose VA records to SSA um, if the veteran signs the appropriate releases, of course, which would be the 827. Um, and we can assist in gathering documentation and completing the SSI and SSDI application forms and referring the veteran um, to SOAR representative needed. So really just giving assistance as much as possible, getting that appropriate release filled out, the 827. Um, and then also so that you know that um, SSA may not be able to, they cannot serve as the authorized representative. So doing the 1696 or the representative payee. Um, so we can look for someone um, who is a contact that knows the veteran or possibly another service provider to, to fill out and um, be the authorized representative via the 1696 form. So, um, so great, so that's a little bit about veterans. Now how about children? So how do children qualify for SSI? So the four main criteria that are considered are the disability, so a medical determin determinal physical or mental impairment which results um, in a marked or severe functional limitation um, and which can be expected to result in death or which has lasted for a continuous period of no less than 12 months. Also, how does the child func child's functional abilities compare to the functional abilities of a child of the same age. So we're looking to really compare and contrast those two pieces. Um, the medical determinable uh, piece around physical or mental impairment and then the functional piece um, compared to a child of the same age. So second, we're looking at income. So we're looking at the parent and household income. Third is the resources, so parent and household resources. And also we're looking at citizen, citizenship or immigration status. So um, it's important to know that when working with um, children, um, especially that are trying to qualify or the parents are trying to get them qualified for SSI, um, this can be helpful um, in some areas because uh, school districts do a great job of keeping records. So if this client has been in school, it can be um, very um, beneficial to, to contact the school and to get some records around their disability from the school or have the client's parents go and get um, information about the disability um, from the school. Um, so that is, uh, that is very important and can be really crucial in, in many of the cases that I've seen here in Texas is really finding out what school they attended or are attending and then contacting them. So around justice involved persons. So it's important for you guys to note, and you, um, this has gone, been gone over in the training itself, but individuals who are, um, uh, have a warrant um, uh, other than escape. Um, so I'm sorry, so individuals that have a warrant for escape, this could prove to be a hindrance to them. Um, other warrants should not hinder a person from applying or receiving a payment. Um, so, um, and then, so, so whether they have a warrant or not, um, they can apply, although, you know, having an, a, an escape, um, warrant is going to really hinder that process. And then of course, a person can apply for benefits while incarcerated. Um, this of course is not to get benefits while they are, um, incarcerated, but once they discharge, um, they can go ahead and start that process while they are in the process of being discharged so that the resources will be there for them. We especially want to focus on our clients that have um, had a history of homelessness and that um, will possibly discharge into homelessness um, from a, a halfway house or such. So, um, and just so you know, um, 
prior history of incarceration alone does not make someone eligible for benefits. So really we have to look at not just the incarceration, but also that, that mental health piece um, as we've been taught through the SOAR curriculum. What, what is that uh, mental health piece and the functionality of that client? Um, getting those records, being able to show the documentation. Um, also for clients that have a history of incarceration, if they um, have a co-occurring disorder, it can be helpful to use this um, as an asset to you being the case manager so that you can show um, that um, while they were incarcerated, um, they were or were not showing um, signs of this um, uh, mental health issue. So just a couple of engagement tips for people in correctional settings. Um, so jails and prisons have distinct cultures. So it's very important to um, know how this culture um, and anticipate the culture and how this culture or code affects behavior and functioning of the prison, within the prison. So um, also knowing that um, to um, expand skills to engage individuals in this culture, really um, talking to the individual, um, being able to um, pull information from them, and um, really um, engaging them in a, in a safe place and, um, and having a positive kind of um, experience or engagement with them to, to get that information so that we can um, get as much information or, to um, turn in around their SSI, SSDI um, application. So, um, so really this is about, you know, knowing that, that prison culture, I was not pr well, jail and prison culture, um, and knowing kind of their life experience, what they've gone through, and just safety for the case manager as well. So a little bit about SSA appeals, um, and we're going to cover this process just briefly. What I would suggest is that in all areas where we do have community um, leads set up, we try to, to um, pull in some individuals from um, an agency that will work with the clients around the appeal process. So if you have somebody like that in your community, um, then you would need to um, take some time and talk to them and um, talk to them about um, how to, you know, kind of the appeal process and how it works. So just to explain a little bit, um, of course, there is the um, starting uh, from the top and going down on your left and from your right, on your right-hand side from the bottom and working up. Um, the initial determination is the first step. Um, and then, so if it's a... Um, if it's a denial, then we do a reconsideration. Um, and then from there, do an administrative hearing and an appeals council review, and then up to a federal court review. So um, being able to, to take the, um, the denial all the way up. Now, um, luckily there is um, an appeal um, um, process that you can walk through online. So you can go to the website um, at socialsecurity.gov um, backslash uh, pgm um, backslash appeal.html um, and you can um, fill out an appeal online. And so that, that can be very helpful. For reconsiderations, um, the first level of appeal is most states. Um, reconsideration is the first level of appeal most states um, except for the ones listed below. Um, Texas is not one of those. A request for reconsideration um, is needed to initiate the appeals process. So we want to make sure we get that filled out and done. And then also so that you know that um, it must be filled out within 60 days of the date of the denial notice. So, um, and plus an extra five days for mailing. So we really got to respond pretty quick within three months or actually a little bit more than three months. Um, I'm sorry not three months, that would be two months. So uh, within two months um, of receiving that um, denial notice. And there's um, three ways to, um, to fill out the forms and file. Um, you want to do a request for a reconsideration. You also want to do a disability report appeal um, and then the authorization to um, disclose information. 
So filling all that out, filling all that information out, and I'll show you where some of those forms are online as well. And then um, all may be all these forms may be attained by the SSA.gov site, which I won't show you that one, but I'll show you the the source site. Um, but feel free to go to the SSA.gov website. So with the reconsideration, DDS um, takes an entirely new look at the case and estimates a new determination on the person's disability. So um, they get a new disability examiner, anal analysis, anal yes, analysis, and um, new reviewing physicians. That's really good to know. It's kind of a fresh start. And then also there's many ways to support um, a claim at this stage. So you can complete a more detailed disability report um, within with the appeal, so that that can be very helpful. Also, revisit revisit the steps in the SOAR model to develop the claim for reconsideration. Um, and so, you can look through the SOAR website, look at the model, and revisit those steps. But going back to the disability report, um, that really need to should be strengthened at this time um, when you're doing a reconsideration. Uh, that way, uh, you can really get off to a, a a kind of a positive step and then go back and revisit the other um, the other pieces. So what do you do if the deadline is passed? Um, well um, if the applicant uh, the applicant can appeal if he or she has good cause for missing the deadline um, or you can ask SSA to accept late filing by giving good cause or reason for the delay. Um, these can be related to the applicant's disability, it could be due to limited English proficiency, um, failure to understand the requirements, um, failure to receive denial notice within five days of the date on the notice, um, or unusual or unavoidable circumstances such as hospitalization. So all of these pieces can play in with the, um, the population that we typically serve through SOAR, especially the hospitalization piece. Um, not or a failure to receive the denial notice. Sometimes if our if our clients um, kind of go dark and we just don't hear from them for a while, um, within a couple of weeks, then you know this gives us um, a little bit of a chance um, to get an extension. And then um, you know um, especially um, clients that might not understand the requirements. So it's very important um, here that if we get a denial back from a client, uh, for a client, and kind of, you know, if we are their point of contact, we need to keep that, we need, first of all, we need to let them know about that as quickly as possible. If for some reason we can't let them know, if we can't um, get a hold of them, then we need to start tracking that. Um, and maybe even, even if you, maybe even preparing the paperwork to follow some of these other steps if you think that the client might be showing up later. Um, so this can be um, very important. So appeal versus a new application. So um, starting a new application um, results in um, the loss of an earlier protective filing date and the potential loss of months of back benefits. So um, requesting a consideration, reconsideration preserves that protective filing date and potential eligibility for months of, of back benefits. So that's why we really want to make sure that a client, our client knows the difference between these two and they can make a choice. Um, as I was just saying, especially if um, they're not around when we get a denial, being able to um, make an appeal for them. Um, so if they know that they need to come back and check with, up with us on a regular basis, that can, that can be helpful. So just so you know, some reasons for the denial. Um, so um, there could be a request, um, the electronic folder, so a CD from SSA or Office of um, Disability and Adjudication to review um, this uh, the case. So they can um, request um, to review the CD. They can review it and um, to ascertain the evidence on file and rationale for denial. Um, they can re review um, earnings record to make sure um, that there are no SGA earnings and they can make note of errors, omissions, and plan, so plan your strategy. So um, this is what SSA is gonna look at um, or DDS is gonna look at. Um, they could request the electronic file and review that. Um, they're gonna kind of ascertain evidence um, a rationale for denial, and then reviewing the earnings um, record 
um, to make sure there's no S SGA earnings. So, so as long as we are kind of making note of any errors um, or omissions, and we kind of plan on our strategy, we should be able to um, to kind of avoid denials. Um, at least that's the plan. So um, we want to kind of, as I, you know, as I mentioned before, when we're turning in the medical summary reports, we want to um, change any errors, we anything we omitted, we want to, you know, submit that. Um, then of course, you know, we can change our strategy um, and we can um, appeal or reapply depending on what the client wants. So around a administrative hearing, um, this administrative hearing is with an administrative law judge. So um, it, you can have an administrative hearing if you're denied at reconsideration um, and uh, you're not in a prototype state, so we don't have to worry about that. And also, um, you can file a pill online within 60 days of the decision um, to, uh, to get an administrative hearing. You... Um, they will review the claim, including the evidence used to deny the claim, um, and submit. you can submit new evidence if applicable, um, and you should definitely plan to attend the hearing. So, um, so you know, this happens pretty quick. Um, this administrative hearing, you can request it. Um, they're going to hear the evidence. You can submit new evidence um, if it's applicable, and then, you know, you can do that when, when you show up for the hearing or, or previously. So on the on the record reviews, um, an OTR, um, a written request asking. So an OTR is a written request asking that the administrative law judge make a favorable decision based on the evidence in the case record. A favorable decision is the only decision possible through an OTR review. Otherwise, there are no there is no decision, and the hearing process goes forward through the OTR as though the OTR never happened. Um, if you are requesting a decision based on new evidence um, that has become available since the DDS denial, you can um, request an OTR. Um, uh, and then there's a note down there, it can be as big as a catastrophic worsening of the, the claimant's condition or as small as the onset date that was entered incorrectly. So it can be um, kind of a, a data issue if something was added or entered incorrectly or if there is a new issue with the client's mental health um, and their condition. So this can be requested by the claimant or SOAR representative um, but is often done through a screening process by the ODR, ODAR, um, the attorney adjudicators, in an effort to clear um, hearing backlogs. So, um, so yeah, lots of uh, lots of new information. Um, and just so you guys know, especially around this whole process um, for um, the uh, appeal process, uh, as I mentioned before, um, you know, go to the the online um, website uh, and you can um, look at some of the uh, the informational pieces. Uh, that SOAR has to offer, as well as talk to your local lead around who might be doing appeals in your area. And so finally, um, I wanted to just, um, this is the SOAR website, and so this is the SOAR website here. You can see here um, online courses, SOAR in your state, application toolbox, and then if you go down um, around the online tracking or OAT, that's um, what we discussed earlier today. And um, there is the online application tracking tool. Um, so you have, you'll have a user login and a password that you'll put in there. And then, um, so that's around OAT, that's, where, that's how you access OAT. And then for the other pieces around applications specifically, You can go to the library here, and you can look on appeals. And PRA has put together some great information for you guys around appeals. Um, there's information on the left, how do you soar in the appeal process, um, what this looks like. And then on the right, um, we have um, just other um, 
uh, links to um, appeals and the pieces of appeals, as well as other um, pieces, you know, helping clients within the criminal justice system, engaging clients, healthcare. So lots of um, lots of uh, good links. But definitely, you want to go here if you have if you're looking at the appeal process and and how it all works. So, so I wanted to thank you guys for joining me for this part three um, of the uh, fundamentals for fundamentals online piece um, kind of lecture series and so um, I try to just kind of skim over things and make it as quick as possible and efficient as possible if you have any other questions feel free to ask your local SOAR lead which should be there in the room with you or ask um, or um, you can contact me so um, again my contact information is chris k-r-i-s at t-h-n dot org that's k-r-i-s at t-h-n dot org and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you guys for joining me today, and I am going to um, close out this webinar.